Hey everybody, welcome back. We are reading Nietzsche. Um, our last video was sort of a general introduction uh, to him, some of the you know major themes um, in his work and what's, you know, what's going on with him. Now we're gonna uh, use this video to talk about the Greek state, some early bit of writing by him. It's gonna give us some provocative things to think about. Um, so if you will, if you'll go ahead and open up your book and follow along with me. Uh, we're starting on page um, 88 of your reader, and it's the first page of, um, of this work, The Greek State. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by uh, just reading from that first paragraph. Nietzsche writes, we moderns have the advantage over the Greeks with two concepts given as consolation, as it were, to a world which behaves in a thoroughly slave-like manner whilst anxiously avoiding the word slave. We speak of the dignity of man and of the dignity of work. We struggle wretchedly to perpetuate a wretched life. This terrible predicament necessitates exhausting work which man, or more correctly, human intellect, seduced by the will, now and again admires as something dignified. Um, so let's pause there for a second. Um, Nietzsche is, I think, largely being um, somewhat ironic uh, with that first sort of sentence that he's saying that we have this advantage um, over the Greeks. And, you know, maybe maybe he's not being ironic. Maybe it is an advantage, um, although I'm, I'm not entirely convinced. Um, but more pressing, whether or not he's being ironic or not, is that he's saying that the Greeks were able to accept something like, or not something like, like actually uh, slavery, right, as, a, as, a, as an institution. And, you know, living in the times that, that, that we live in, um, you know, we find that uh, a abhorrent, um, you know, relic of the past, um, largely, I mean, wherever it still might exist, but in the developed uh, world, um, you know, this is something that we feel that we have evolved past, that our society has somehow uh, progressed to the point where, you know, we no longer have or need, uh, if we ever needed, uh, slaves. And and there's going to be, I want to say a little bit more about this uh, here in a little bit when we get to another passage, but what Nietzsche is saying um, is that it's still with us. Um, however, we get to avoid using the word slave because we have adopted two conceptual hallucinations. And these two conceptual hallucinations are that humans are dignified, uh, in, you know, inherently, and that work is dignified. And that when you tell people that um, human beings are um, inherently dignified and that whatever um, work or labors they have to perform to sort of get by in the developed industrialized uh, world, that that work is, is, is dignified as well, that basically what you do is you, you create or you perpetuate a class of people that are essentially still performing the uh, the role of slavery to sort of make um, to make society go uh, um, a an obliged working class, um, and you know you you, you might want to think about that and see see take a sort of honest stock of you know what goes on um, in the world with what's what's asked of people in terms of how they're able to participate and meet their needs or get the things that they want and to see how it uh, lines up with what uh, Nietzsche uh, is saying here. Um, he says, <clears throat> we struggle wretchedly to perpetuate a wretched life. You know, that, that the Greeks understood this and we've forgotten it or we believe that we've evolved past it. Um, and again, that human life is somehow intrinsically wonderful or that it's intrinsically valuable, right? Um, 
he says, uh, but to justify the claim of work uh, to be honored. So remember, it's human, human life and it's work, and that these two things have been sort of propped up by having uh, dignity. He says, Exist uh, existence itself, to which work is simply a painful means, would above all have to have somewhat more dignity and value placed on it than appears to have been the case with serious-minded philosophies and religions up till now. What can we in the toil and moil of all the millions, billions, other than the drive to exist at any price, the same all-powerful drive which makes stunted plants push their roots into arid rocks? And so that last part sounds a bit like what we discussed previously in terms of will to power. Then, you know, um, I think that's right. That's, that's, that's what he's you know, alluding to there. That these, these things that we think are dignified are, are no more than a sort of conceptualization of something that's basically a, a life imperative or a, a, a um, survival imperative that it's sort of you know built into the phenomenon of existing things to survive at any cost um, like that grass that uh, you know it's, here it's uh, you know through arid rocks um, you know or through concrete or in any other sort of scenario that you might find it that, that life is struggling to exist you know from 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 top to bottom in terms of the uh, the hierarchy or the or the spectrum uh, of life um, we just happen to via the human intellect or the, the broad phenomenon of, of consciousness somehow invent a new system of interpretation by which we um, choose to see differently uh, what it is that's going on. Uh, but Nietzsche wants to sort of pierce the veil of illusion or delusion to say, you know, it's really no different. We're just convincing ourselves that it's somehow different, that it's somehow um, dignified. But when we really see what's going on in terms of our history, in terms of our um, motivations, in terms of the power dynamics at play within society, um, that it is still incredibly creaturely, um, and it is not. It is not. It is not the sort of thing that we think that it is, and that value and that dignity and that other sort of related um, themes or ideas aren't just present and just simply real. That these are things that have been um, constructed and things that we have become accustomed to, that we've been habituated uh, into. And so now we interpret our lives and our undertakings, uh, how we plan out and plot out our futures um, as workers, um, as you know, working for a business or starting a business, um, engaging in all sorts of social, political, and economic activities. Um, but that really we could strip all that down and uh, we could see um, you know, the wretchedness uh, behind it. And let's, let's I know for some of you, you're like, oh my God, I don't, I don't know what to do with this or I don't like this. Some of you are like, yeah, that's exactly what's going on. So, you know, wherever you're at, just, you know, follow along and, and, and see if uh, what Nietzsche is saying, on one hand, at least makes sense and then begin to see if it, uh, if it convinces you. Um, <clears throat> so drop down a paragraph. Again, we're on page 88 at the bottom. He says... The Greeks have no need for conceptual hallucinations like this. They voice their opinion that work is a disgrace with shocking openness and a more concealed, less frequently expressed wisdom, which was nevertheless alive everywhere, added that the human being was also a disgraceful and pathetic non-entity and shadow of a dream. Work is a disgrace because existence has no inherent value. You know what he's what he's trying to sort of flesh out here, and perhaps you know, like shock us somewhat, is that um, it it's not it's not written into the fabric of being. It's not written into the way things really are that human beings matter. That this is rather the adoption into uh, a belief system or um, into uh, an ideology of sorts that, you know, that tells us that life 
uh, matters, that individuals uh, matter. Um, and he's using the Greeks as a sort of, you know, the, the, the prototypical or maybe original culture that um, achieved so much greatness, um, you know, like that we even know that the Greeks existed and that, you know, their, their art, their culture, their philosophy, <clears throat> their way of life, um, you know, we have, again, each of these particular things could, of course, be, you know, parsed out and, and, and explored with further link, but you know, we still we still engage in the Olympics, right? It's Greek um, democracy. It's, it's Greek. Um, the fascination with freedom. That's 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 Greek. Um, you know, we're taking a philosophy class. It's 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 a Greek invention largely, and you know, Nietzsche is saying that the reason that their culture was able to accomplish so much was with a a fundamental acknowledgement or recognition that human life was was basically pathetic, right? And in, in the sense of you know, deriving from the word pathos, that it's that it's it's suffering, that it is it is something that has to be, has to be justified. It's not inherently justified. That life has to be excused. That it's not inherently excused. That it's that the reason that they strove. Um, for greatness was because if they didn't achieve greatness, if they didn't, if they didn't undertake um, meaningful, purposeful, risky, daring uh, undertakings, that um, you know that that life basically was just uh, another sort of recurrence of something being born and dying, like anything else um, in nature. And that it just made it worse that we knew that it was going to happen. At least the other sort of creatures and vegetative forms of existence, at least they don't have to like deal with the fact that they're going to die. They just get to sort of happen and then stop happening. Um, but we grow into an awareness of what's happening to us. And so in part, we invent um, religious or philosophical or political, or any, anything like that, that uh, we invent these systems that help us to sort of um, cope with this awareness and all the complexities that uh, are a result of, of that awareness of our situation. Um, and so, you know, one of the things we need to take seriously is, uh, is, is the claim of, of, a, of a, an essential sort of nihilism, um, not, a, not a necessarily, uh, we're not, we don't have to be resigned to a sort of personal or social uh, nihilism, which I think Nietzsche believes through healthy cultural practices could be avoided, but an essential nihilism in the sense that our ontological situation, just you know, uh, the being of human beings itself, has to confront that there is no inherent meaning to things, that there is no inherent value to things. I think these are things that are, that are created uh, by those that uh, have, have the will, have the talent, um, you know, have the luck, of being able to, to forge that. So um, on page 89, he talks some about uh, art, and there's some interesting stuff here, especially like in that middle paragraph. Um, in a, I'll, I'll just try to, to speak about it real quickly. Um, and it's the relationship between art, shame, and necessity. And that is that we don't, we don't largely associate the notion of shame with uh, beauty or art, but, uh, you know, for Nietzsche and, and for other thinkers, um, there's a sort of necessary connection in that um, he, he, he mentions, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some artists and what, what we like when we see art is we like the finished product. We like the sort of beautiful thing that we see, but what, you know, what we don't necessarily like to think about is all of the hard work and all of the sort of um, stuff that's going on behind the scenes, so to speak, you know, and it could, it could be, it could be akin to like movie making um, as a, a, a more contemporary sort of example in which we just like to see the, the TV show or the video game, or we like to see, you know, the movie. And that is this really sort of fine working presentation of, of the narrative, the action, the, the whatever's going on. 
And, you know, it, it, it somewhat would take away or diminish from the intended effect by um, thinking about all of the sort of special effects works that goes into or people running lines and rehearsing or, you know, the, the hundred takes that they did to, to get the right take. I mean, we know that that stuff goes on, but that's not really necessarily what we're bringing to mind to get the full sort of um, uh, or the intended aesthetic experience. And so there's a, there's a sense of, of shame about the labor and the work that goes into it. Uh, we know that it's necessary, but it's not what we want to think about. That, that in some ways, while it's necessary, it might somewhat diminish or embarrass or, or alter the actual thing um, itself. And, and, you know, that, that we could talk about that more, but... I would say that it's it's like, to use a more organic biological example, um, and he mentions this again in that middle paragraph, it's sort of like if someone compliments a parent about their child, you know, about, you know, how, how beautiful they are, or, you know, oh, you know, what a lovely child, um, you know, they're thinking about the child, and, and what they're not thinking about is, you know, what brought the child into being, you know, that there's something um private discreet about about that that we don't we don't want to think about um parents uh doing what they do to make a child not not that not that there's <laughs> anything um you know wrong with it obviously uh but that every human being we see is the result of the procreative act and then the act of you know um labor and so on and so forth and, you know, these are necessary aspects of the being of people, but that's not the thing that we want to think about. You know, and, and, I mean, you can personalize it. Like the, the last thing that you want to think about is your parents like engaging in, you know, <laughs> whatever. Sorry for that thought. But that that is uh, that that's a necessary um, part of this process that, that, that brings people in, into being. And so there's this interesting relationship. Uh, between art or the beautiful, you know, necessity and shame. And and this is playing into his sort of, um, you know, what he's trying to say here about these and these ideas that we have that are, that are somewhat conceptual hallucinations that we use to sort of fool ourselves into participating in necessity, but towards, you know, um, some way that's perhaps more palatable. Um, for those that want to not just have a palatable existence, but want to have a sort of um, honest and daring existence, they're going to have to confront these things. So let's go to um, the bottom of uh, the page on 89, the last few lines of it. He says, in order for there to be a broad, deep, fertile soil for the development of art, the overwhelming majority of, of people in a society, has to be slavishly subjected to life's necessity and the service of the minority, beyond the measure that is necessary for the individual. At their expense, through their extra work, this, this enslaved majority, that privileged class, that aristocratic minority, is to be removed from the struggle for existence in order to produce and satisfy a new world of necessities. So, you know, for Nietzsche, think, think of society as sort of as a, as a pyramid in which the vast majority are part of this bottom strata. And these are the laborers and the workers that, whether we call them slaves or not, um, that are functioning in that, in that uh, economic and that historic um, and that societal capacity. And why do they do it? So that the next tier up on the, on the pyramid um, can engage in this sort of higher uh, production of culture. That this is like this is this is kind of getting us closer to what it's all about: art, um, art as as creation within a culture. Um, you know, the writing of books and music and you know the architecture and all this stuff. That these things aren't in a base sense necessary, right? It's not. It's not the food and it's not the houses, you know, with keeping us, you know, putting a roof over our heads and, and those sorts of necessities. 
um, but it's a different sort of necessity that's justifying the very existence of the society. Like, what's it all for? Is it is it is it all just so that <clears throat> we can just be alive, um, or is it or is it so that we can actually make something um, as as a people, right? And so. For Nietzsche, again, because of this, um, you know, the, the, the aristocratic aspect of his philosophy, um, the vast majority belong to the herd. They belong to, you know, following conventions, you know, consuming things. Uh, I mean, that in the sense of not just food, but just, you know, they, they, they consume the products of culture. Um, and that's just sort of how they live. They don't, they don't really create the products of culture. They're just sort of providing us with this basic level of um, necessary infrastructure so that these others, these creators um, who are creating value, they're creating meaning, they're creating the stuff that um, justifies society. So, and there's, gonna, there's a tier that's even above that, and we'll see that in a second here. Um, top of page 90, he says, accordingly, we must learn to identify as a cruel sounding truth, the fact that this is italicized, so you just really want to, get, to emphasize it, slavery belongs to the essence of a culture. A truth though, which leaves open no doubt about the absolute value of existence, right? Which there, there's not an absolute value to existence. Um, you know, if it were, then, then, then you know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have slavery. And I know that some of you, again, are probably thinking, well, we don't. And, the point that Nietzsche is making is, regardless if we call it that or not, that the vast majority of our society must engage in labor. And, and, and we can even say here that this isn't just manual labor. This is now entering the realm of intellectual labor, that, you know, you are part of a workforce, right? And, and so some of the early comments that, that, you know, we've made in these videos, um, you know, regarding how we view higher education, that higher education isn't even really about higher education for most people anymore, that it's really, you go to college or university because you want a job, that one of the more, um, let's say interesting, although we could say, you know, um, somewhat insidious uh, development is convincing people to, you know, actively and enthusiastically um, to, engage in a, a, a matter, a manner of education that is really all about how to make them, um, you know, productive contributors to the bottom strata of society as, you know, mere sort of cogs in the machine of state that, you know, keep the economy uh, going. And there are other thinkers, you know, much past Nietzsche's time um, that will play this up, but especially in, in uh, through a sort of uh, Marxist or Marxian or critical theory uh, way in which it's, it's, it's really analyzed in terms of, of the economy and not just in the sort of broader strokes that Nietzsche is using in terms of, you know, culture. Um, you know, Nietzsche's interests turn much more upon those who are actually creating culture and, and, and value and, and also the historic impediments to that. And while he certainly has things to say um, about uh, politics and economy, those, those aren't necessarily, I would say, his, his, uh, his, in, his specific interests. Um, so, yeah, those, those are those are some harsh some harsh teachings that uh, I know we all probably have really strong feelings about, but uh, I think if you can get your mind around what he's saying, it's a it's um, it's a powerful argument, it's powerful criticism. Um, so he says this truth um, that slavery belongs to the essence of a culture. Um, again, and if I didn't, if this hasn't been played up enough, it's not as though Nietzsche knows. Uh, doesn't know that this is terrible. It is terrible. He believes that it's terrible, um, and part of what just makes it so the much more, so so much so terrible is that it's necessary, um, and that and that he sees this as just the 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 way that it 
works to have a society that the majority of people have to be relegated to this status, whether we call it for what call it what it is or not. Um, and so, make sure that we understand that he says the truth. This truth is the vulture which gnaws at the liver of the Promethean promoter of culture. The misery of men living a life of toil has to be increased to make the production of the world of art possible for a small number of Olympian men. Right? This is just the, that's his way of talking about these these culture creators. And so, you know, when you think art, you probably think like some cool pictures or you know maybe music or something. I mean, Nietzsche means it in the, a very broad way that any sort of cultural artifact, performance, um, you know, anything that is creating the value by which we know what's like good, you know, um, that makes, that, that, that is desirable, that makes life worth living, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and there's, of course, a much larger narrative at work here in which when that when that stuff gets co-opted by particular socio-political economic practices, it no longer has the ability to do this. And it's rather relegated to performing something like an, an anesthetizing um, function or a, um, a an amusing function. And so instead of art in this broad way, providing us value and providing us meaning, it just becomes a way to like cope with life. And so we just sort of veg out to, to music. We just sort of veg out to videos, you know, like we go down a, a dark YouTube spiral of, you know, you know just endless nonsense um, or, or whatever else. Um, and, and, you know, Nietzsche isn't really exploring that uh, here, but this would be a, um, uh, a bit of a tragedy, you know, within the broad <laughs> drama of tragedy uh, in which we are losing the very things that even um, justify the fact that our that our state um, or whatever state we find ourselves in, you know, the U.S. or Europe or, you know, somewhere else in the world. Right. Um, and so art has to have this sort of genuine um, life affirming function or else. Then we're headed for that 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 sort of social societal nihilism that that Nietzsche is trying to, to stave off and warn us about. Um, he says here we find the source of that hatred which has been nourished by the communist and the socialist. Nietzsche is not a fan, um, as well as their paler descendants, the white race of liberals of every age against the arts, but also against classical antiquity. I mean, so Nietzsche is it's not he's not. Not a fan of the, the communists, the socialists, is not a fan of the sort of Western liberal democracies. And, and here in that sense, liberal democracy, like depending on your level of awareness about you know such terms, um, you know, he means liberal in the sense that a democratic state, you know, using the, 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 the powers of the state um, to promote uh, you know freedom and liberties. Um, and, you know, especially synced up with uh, a capitalistic economic model. And Nietzsche finds, you know, all of these things uh, problematic. Um, he says, if culture were really left to the discretion of a people with inescapable powers, which are law and restraint of the individual did not rule, then the glorification of spiritual poverty and the anaclastic, iconoclastic destruction of the claims of art would be more than the revolt of the oppressed masses against drone-like individuals. It would be the cry of pity, tearing down the walls of culture, the urge for justice, the equal sharing of the pain would swamp all other ideas. I mean, he's basically saying if, if, if like the Greeks, um, we lose this sort of fundamental understanding that life doesn't have inherent meaning and value, you know, that work is not dignified, and we start to take these things as given, then what might end up happening, and has happened, is that we would glorify spiritual poverty, and we would democratize, we would equalize, um, you know, the sharing of the pain, and we would have this sort of sense of justice as equating to um, equality or fairness. And for Nietzsche, that's devastating for culture that this um, this creates 
uh, false conditions that are, are sort of the denial of a, of a basic ontological structure of the state and the way that things um, are and perhaps should be if we want a culture that creates genuine, life-affirming, life-excusing value. <clears throat> he goes on to say, um, actually, an over-exuberant pity did break down the floodgates of cultural life for a brief period now and then. A rainbow of pitying love and peace appeared with the first radiance of Christianity, and beneath it, Christianity's most beautiful fruit, the gospel of St. John, was born. I mean, although Nietzsche has the hot, you know, opinions that he has, um, you know, he can acknowledge beautiful writing and, and beautiful ideas, and he sees that in, in Christianity to a limited extent, and that he, he finds that the gospel of John is you know, perhaps the most sublime thing, the most sublime, um, you know, artifact that uh, Christianity generated. Um, that it's a sort of genuine <clears throat> presentation of, of, of a deep compassion. Um, but Nietzsche feels that that what what really is going on with Christianity and other, other religions that preach similar moralities is a form of spiritual impoverishment. And that spiritual impoverishment, you know, meekness and temperance and, you know, forgiveness and all these very sort of anti-life affirming powers um, basically impoverish everyone and end up making people um, largely hypocrites that, you know, they're denying what it is that they really want to be and what they want to do. Um, and instead adopting a facade of uh, compassion and pity, um, but that really that these are just modes, uh, that, these, that, these, that these develop uh, resentment and express themselves through a variety of, you know, revenge tactics um, in people's lives. And, you know, I'm sure for a lot of you, uh, that that uh, might be challenging. Um, and for some of you, you're like, that's right. Um, and it's usually the case with reading Nietzsche that uh, it finds immediate resonance or, you know, um, is, you know, gets, gets some initial pushback. But again, just something to sort of think through. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> Let's uh, try to get through a little bit more of this. Um, down at the bottom of page 90, um, 10 or 12 lines up, he says, the enormous social problems of today are engendered by the excessive sensitivity of modern man, not, that, not by true and deep compassion for that misery. And even if it were true that the Greeks were ruined because they kept slaves, the opposite is even more certain that we will be destroyed because we failed to keep slaves. An activity which neither the original Christians nor the Germanic tribes found it all objectionable, let alone re reprehensible. That there's that there's not prohibitions against slavery, um, you know, uh, in in Christianity and other and other uh, old religions. And that was just taken as part of like how the world was structured, how, how society was structured. Um, and so Nietzsche is not trying to champion some sort of proletariat uprising um, in which the workers take over. That's, he, he's not. He's not. He's not arguing for that. Um, that he's saying that uh, we we need this working class, this slave class, um, so that certain few, a certain few people uh, or group of people, you know, a class of people, can um, have their various necessities taken care of, and so they can they can create these other sort of necessities uh, or really they're freed from necessities and they're and they can engage in this 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 cultural work and it's only within that sort of structure that like um, genuine compassion can even take place between these uh, distinguished classes with different privileges and different liberties um, otherwise what you have is just the the facade and perhaps the um, perhaps even the corruption of genuine compassion according to, to Nietzsche's analysis um, on page 91, he says, um, drop down about uh, nine or ten lines, he says, the Greeks have given us a hint with their instinct for the law of nations, which even at the height of their civilization and humanity never cease to shout from lips of iron such phrases as, the defeated belong to the victor, together with his wife and child, goods and blood, power 
gives the first right. And there is no right which is not fundamentally presumption, usurpation, and violence. Like there's no, there's no really graceful, majestic, um, you know, seamless transition out of like old barbaric ways and into like the enlightened ways and which like, oh, well now we have like the rule of law and now we have a constitution and now we've got, you know, uh, democracy or, you know, whatever, whatever this might be. And, oh, we have, we have this very, um, well-oiled machinery of, of the market, um, and, uh, you know, labor markets and, uh, you know, go down the list of all this stuff, right? And what Nietzsche is saying, the Greeks understood, and, and, and the Greeks aren't naive. They lived a long time ago, but, but the Greeks understood the nature of existence better than we do and the role of the state better than we do, Nietzsche is arguing. <clears throat> and what he's saying here is they understood that power, power comes from the spilling of blood. It comes from the exercising of power and that, you know, you, you take what it is that you can take. And that, he says here, um, power gives the first right and there's no right which is not fundamentally presumption, usurpation, and violence. That around the world, if you, if you take off your rose-colored glasses and you look, um, power, the, 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 the maintaining of power, the expansion of power, whether that's happening through economic means, militaristic means, um, through, you know, uh, cultural, um, you know, the spreading of, of, of particular aspects of culture and entertainment or culture industry, um, whatever this, whatever this might be, that the dynamics at play there is one of subordination uh, to power, and that it just works so much better if you can convince people, especially you know, um, in, in, in the modern age, that um, if you can convince them that something else is happening than what's really happening, and then power can exercise itself in a in a much more invisibly, uh, in an invisible way that's much more again palatable, much more acceptable, and perhaps even laudable uh, by some. But that's not really what's going on. Power is always piracy it's always it's always vicious um he says here let's go um page 92 page 92 second paragraph he says it is through this mysterious connection which we sense here between the state and art political greed and artistic creation, battlefield and work of art, that, as I said, we understand the state only as the iron clamp producing society by force. Whereas without the state and the natural bellum omnia contra omnis, the war of all against all, society is completely unable to grow roots in any significant measure beyond the family sphere. So, so beyond just like existing in primitive encampments or something, um, the way that we have a society is, is we understand a society is at the top of that pyramidical structure is you need, um, even above the artistic uh, genius, above the artistic class, you need a war class, you need a militaristic genius. Um, and I, I don't mean that as a single individual, but as a, as a way of talking about like a, a warrior-minded imagination, rationality um, that is able to execute force and power and to wage war. And that this is what creates for this dynamic soil that is sort of keeping um, fertilized the, the, the ground, as it were, that society is sort of based on. That once you lose a class of people and a sort of dedication to this type of um, aggressive, uh, you know, power-centric um, um, inbuilt uh, motivation and activity to the state that the state will um, weaken that it will um, it will it will no longer be dynamic it will start to become static it will start to perhaps become decadent it will perhaps um, you know collapse in upon itself and this is what keeps it sort of going you could you could perhaps do an interpretation um, of you know the, the history of Rome to talk about this or you know other other um, other empires, uh, that this is something that has to happen to the health of the state. And again, we have 
strong feelings about this. You should have strong feelings about this. Um, and, you know, Nietzsche is here not pulling any punches about what he thinks is the case um, in, in terms of having a healthy culture and a healthy state. Um, and, and let me just remind you, like, Nietzsche's not like, he's, he's not pro, he's not pro um, communist, he's not pro Western democracy. He's, the ways that we have perhaps um, conceptualized this or thought that this is being applied and happening, Nietzsche, Nietzsche does not see that. That there, are, there's some subtleties to what Nietzsche, it, does, it, does, it may not be apparent here, but there's some subtleties of thought that hopefully will come out, you know, in these other readings that we're doing. Um, in which we'll see that it's it's not just a matter of a state acquiring power and using that power. There, that there's more to it than that. So you, if you can, be patient on that front. Um, let's see. Page 94, the last few lines of that top paragraph, he says, but what I've demonstrated here with a single example is valid in the most general sense. Every man with his whole activity is only dignified, this is taking us back to the beginning of this, of this piece is only dignified to the extent that he is a tool of genius, whether that's artistic or militaristic, that you serve the state, right? Consciously or unconsciously, willingly or not <laughs> willingly, whereupon we immediately deduce the ethical conclusion that man as such, absolute man, possesses neither dignity nor rights nor duties, only as a completely determined being. Uh, serving unconscious purposes can man excuse his existence. So, like, if you're not one of these cultures creators and you're not at the top, you know, ruling through you know militaristic designs or expressions of, of power in this or that way, that the way that you serve this sort of greater cause is by yourself being a um, a worker who maintains um, the, the basic infrastructure of the state and do that. And your life is sort of excused. That that's how you would that's how you would dignify your life, not by believing that it's inherently dignified. Um, you got to do something. You got you got to participate. And it doesn't matter if you're doing this knowing the score, as it were, or not. Just as long as you're doing it. So hopefully that's given you a lot to think about. We'll come back with um, uh, a reading of Homer's contest after this. Uh, so until then, keep reading. Uh, keep thinking.